Hey guys, how's it going? Uh, I come to you with yet another tag. Um, so this is the Lay Miz tag, which I was tagged in by Sean the Book Maniac. Uh, it's ten questions uh, based on characters from Lay Miz. Um, so I'll just get right to it. So number one, Jean Valjean, a book that deals with morality or journeys. I'm gonna go with uh, Measure for Measure by Shakespeare, which I just posted posted a video about. Um, it looks a lot at uh, morality and how it conflicts with uh, people's feelings so much of the time and how it, um, how it so often, uh, makes people unhappy, sort of. Um, and it, yeah. So, uh, I will leave a link to that video below, uh, because I t talked a lot about it. Um, number two is Javert, uh, Javert, a book that was fierce and relentless. Um, and for this I'm gonna go with three novels by Samuel Beckett. So this is a trilogy, but it is not, these three novels here aren't, um, narratively connected, they are th they're more thematically connected. Um, so the first one, Malloy, is about um, this man who is uh, sort of roaming around on his bicycle in the English countryside, ostensibly to visit his mother, who he apparently is very bad at finding. Uh, but you get the sense that really he's just kind of has, he just kind of has no idea where he's going, um, and just kind of the absurd situations he gets himself into, um, and then. Uh, the second novel is about um, a man named Malone, who um, is lying in a hospital bed dying. And that's, the, the, it's basically his thoughts. Um, he thinks up these weird anecdotes um, and also has a, pet, has a fetish for listing out tons of objects that are in the room he's in. Um, and then the last novel is... Uh, the unnameable, where this unnamed man is in a fetal position in a dark cave, and basically the entire novel is just his thoughts, um, and seemingly his attempts, his attempts not to think almost, um, and so these novels are very strange. Um, they Malloy starts out pretty, pretty easy to read, um, pretty I mean absurd in its plot. Um, but, uh, like, for example, the main character is, uh, accused of, uh, acting lewdly because he just kind of stopped, uh, on the sidewalk on his bike and was just kind of standing there, um, with his butt on his bike, bicycle seat, uh, but not moving at all, and then was accused of being lewd. Um, but then Malone gets kind of stream of consciousnessy a little bit, there are some, some narrative parts, and then the unnameable just... It just descends into uh, complete, uh, you know, introspection, uh, and the sentences in the unnameable get longer and longer and more and more confusing. Um, and that is why I think this this book is relentless, is because because of that stream of consciousness style and that um, how more and more confusing this prose gets. Um, you're just exhausted by the end of this book. Um, I had to take a day, a, a day long break from reading because of this book. Uh, so, yeah, that is my answer for that one. Um, number three, Fontaine, an emotional book that tugs at your heartstrings. I'm going to go with Housekeeping by Marilyn Robinson. Um, so this is uh, this was published back in, in 1980, and uh, it's about these two uh, sisters, Lucille and Ruth, who, uh, whose mother commits suicide. And, um, and so they are raised by their Aunt Sylvie uh, in this, this fictional town in Idaho called Fingerbone, and um, Sylvie is kind of eccentric, kind of irresponsible, kind of kooky, um, and Ruth really takes to her, um, really uh, comes to love her, and um, but Lucille really doesn't like her because of how nonconformist she is, and uh, Lucille wants to sort of be a functional member of society, which Sylvie isn't. Sylvie is kind of a drifter, she doesn't really have a home, she kind of just goes from town to town, ostensibly trying to get jobs, but it's never specified. Um, and Lucille doesn't like that. She wants to be, you know, she wants to do things that normal girls her age do and stuff. Uh, but Ruthie really takes to Sylvie and wants to uh, spend her life with her. And so at the end of this novel, uh, the two sisters become estranged um, because of that, uh, because their conflict uh, in that regard gets so intense. Um, and it was just sad because I got the sense that they did love each other. Um, they just didn't see eye to eye, and, um, so yeah, I got very emotional at the end of this book. More emotional than I usually do when reading novels, so, um, yeah, highly recommend it, though. Um, number four, Marius, a book that has a little bit of everything, and for this, 
I am going with The Brothers Karamazov by Fyodor Dostoevsky. Uh, I read this a couple years ago, uh, <clears throat> and, um, yeah, it, it, it just, it has a gripping plot, but it also has, a uh, uh, really high-minded philosophical ideas about, uh, God and morality, um, and it also has great characters, very compelling characters, um, including a very, I think, a very interesting, compelling female character, um, Grishenka. Um, so, yeah, uh, I, I mean, I don't, I think the Brothers Karamazov kind of speaks for itself, but, uh, that is my pick for this question. Um, number five is Eponine, a book with a tragic love story, and for this, I am going with another Marilyn Robinson novel, um, Lila. Um, so, this is, so, Lila is the third book, a third novel in the Gilead trilogy, and so in Gilead, we start off uh, with this reverend named John Ames, who uh, is dying, and the whole book is kind of a, a long letter to his young son, who really, who's only seven, and so won't really get to know him because he'll, he's dying. Uh, and uh, the second book doesn't really relate that much to John Ames and Lila, but Lila is John Ames' wife, and we learn a little bit about her in Gilead, but this novel is devoted entirely to her story, and she... Um, lived at an orphanage. The novel kind of opens with her at an orphanage, and she is really sick. She's being neglected at this orphanage, so this woman um, takes her up uh, and just kind of runs off with her and uh, adopts her. And so she starts to live a life as a drifter, um, kind of just um, her and this her caretaker go from town to town, um, getting odd jobs and living that way. Um, and then eventually she, uh, finds herself in, uh, Gilead, Iowa, and meets John Ames, who couldn't be a more different person from her, you know, he, he has spent his entire life in one town, you know, he's very religious, she, you know, one of the major scenes in here is him baptizing her when she's, you know, a grown adult, um, and, uh, so they couldn't be more different, and also, he is much, much older than her, um, I, you know, I get the sense that she is maybe in her 30s um, when they meet, and he is in his maybe 60s. Um, and you have to think that both of them, when they, you know, were falling in love and got married, they have to think that they both knew that she would outlive him. And um, so, yeah, I mean, if that isn't a tragic love story, marrying someone even though you know you're going to have to live without them for a long time, then I don't know what it is. Um, but yeah, again, highly recommended novel. Um, number six is Cosette, a book where the characters are trapped in dire circumstances. And uh, for this, I'm going with The Good Soldier Schweik by Yaroslav Hasek. Um, this is uh, one of the most major classics of Czech literature. Um, this was published back in the 1920s, and um, it's about this Czech soldier who was drafted into the army to fight for the Austro-Hungarian Empire in World War I. And um, his name is Schweik, uh, Josef Schweik. And um, the reason it's he, the the reason the novel is called the Good Soldier Schweik is because he is a good soldier. Um, you know, if he doesn't follow orders, you know, obviously back then you didn't follow orders, you got shot or got sent to prison. Um, but he does follow orders. But what he does is he follows orders so literally that they basically end up ruining the point of giving the orders. Um, and uh, that sort of uh, way of uh, that sort of um, way of opposing authority um, not only is important to this novel, but actually had a big impact on the sort of Czech psyche because um, during uh, the communist regime in that country, a lot of Czechs sort of took that attitude of uh, appearing to be obedient but sort of being secretly subversive. Um, so yeah, this is a really funny novel. I need to reread it though. Um, Maybe I'll end up picking it up for the rereadathon. I don't know, um, but yeah. Number seven is the Thenardier, uh, a comic book. And for this, I I've I've uh, shown blue is the warmest color like five times on this channel. So I'm gonna go with a manga, which I know is sort of different, but I mean they're basically the same idea. Um, so the manga I I, I want to mention is Future Diary, and um, so this manga follows um, Yukiteru, who is. Um, this 14-year-old boy who finds himself selected as one of 12 contestants in a battle royale, um, the winner of which will get to become God. Um, yes, that is, that is the premise of this, of this manga. Um, 
And one of the other contestants is a girl named Yuno, who's about the same age as him, and she is, like, head over heels in love with Yukiteru. And she wants him to win, and she does everything to help him, and she's also kind of crazy. Um, you know, she kills people with axes in gruesome fashion. This is a very violent, very dark manga. Um, but, uh, actually, I do think it, it explores a lot of human themes. All of the contestants, uh, in the, in the game, game, uh, have a very personal reason for wanting to be God. Um, you know, there's one who's a young boy who has been abused by his parents, and he wants to become God to stop, uh, you know, basically child abuse. There's a woman who owns an orphanage who, um, you know, cares about children and wants to become God to help all of the children. Um, there, there is a woman, another woman who's actually a terrorist, who wants to end sort of corruption and uh, oppression. Um, so all these people have these very human, very personal reasons for wanting to become God, and they all have a very uh, complicated background. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I thought, I mean, it's not, you know, it's not a great work of literature or something, but I, I thought it was pretty good. It was also made into a really good anime. Um, so yeah, Future Diary. Um, next is, I'm not sure how to pronounce this name, on Jura, uh, a book about masculinity or heroism. And uh, for this, I'm going with Closely Watched Trains by Bohemil Hrabal. And um, so Bohemil Hrabal, another Czech author, um, Closely Watched Trains takes place during World War II, at the tail end of World War II, when it's uh, pretty clear that uh, the Germans are going to lose. Um, but they still uh, have control over Czechoslovakia. And this is about a young man... Um, named uh, Milos, who uh, is 22 years old and works at a train station, and he is just full of angst. And, um, you know, he, he's 22 years old, and he's uh, a virgin, and he sees that as this huge personal failing, um, and he's so uh, worked up over the fact that uh, that he hasn't had sex ever before. And um, to put in perspective just how, uh, how bad this is, he... At the beginning of the novel, you find out that he actually attempted suicide after after he tried to have sex with a woman he's in love with and uh, basically couldn't perform. Uh, and um, so I think this novel really looks at these masculine um, norms and how toxic they are for men. Um, there's the virginity thing, which is often um, targeted at men as this value judgment. You know, if you're not a virgin, some, or if you are a virgin, you're somehow not manly. Um, but also um, heroism, uh, which is a part of the question. Um, what uh, Milos gets involved in this uh, scheme to blow up this train uh, with a with a, a bomb, a time bomb uh, that is bringing uh, weapons to the Nazi army. Um, and you see through that too, these sort of hero ideas of heroism and how that is, um, deadly too. Um, I may have just implied a spoiler, but anyway, <laughs> anyway, closely watched trains. I really love this novel. Number nine is, uh, The Priest, an uplifting book. And for this, I'm going to go with Crazy Brave by Joy Harjo. And, um, so this is a, a memoir, uh, Joy Harjo's memoir. Joy Harjo is a, is a poet, but this is a memoir she wrote. Um, of her childhood up until she's in her 20s, in her mid-20s, I believe. Um, and she uh, was raised uh, in the Creek Nation in o Oklahoma, on a Creek reservation in Oklahoma. And um, she had, she, her father, her biological father, left her mother uh, when she was very young. She hardly remembers her father. Um, and then her mother got remarried to a man who wasn't so much abusive as actively evil toward uh, Joy and her siblings. Um, and so she suffered from a lot of abuse from this man. Um, but eventually she got out and went to a, an Indian art school in New Mexico and sort of started to learn to paint. Um, she's a musician. She started writing. Um, she acted a little bit. Uh, and um, she really finds uh, her way with art. But it's a very... It's a very uh, rocky road. I mean, she has a lot of twists and turns in her life. She uh, she gets pregnant as a as a seventeen year old um, with a man who's not responsible. Um, she then leaves that man, then gets in a relationship with another man who turns out to be an alcoholic, and you kind of see her struggling with alcohol. She also, I think, has very low self esteem. 
um, she shows throughout this novel, and panic attacks. Um, but in the end, at the end of this novel, she really um, finds a way, if not to, uh, you know, f she doesn't necessarily, she's not cured by her art, but she finds a way to cope with, um, you know, her panic attacks and her anxiety and all the, you know, sadness in her life through art. Um, and uh, so, yeah, and I, I loved this novel, uh, highly recommended. Once again, very beautifully written, and I recommend her poetry, too. Um, so, yeah, and the last question is Gavroche, a short, unexpectedly good read that took you by surprise. And for this, I'm going with an another Samuel Beckett, uh, Waiting for Gatto. Uh, I read this mainly because uh, my grandpa it was a uh, Beckett scholar, and uh, so he always kind of talked about Beckett and sort of talked about this play in particular and recommended it to me. Um, and so I was just like, okay, whatever, I'll indulge my grandpa and read it. And uh, I read it all in one afternoon and then watched a lecture about it and then watched a production of it that's on YouTube. And it, it had such a big impact on me. Um, this is a very simple story. It's the uh, story of um, Vladimir and Estragon, who are these two men who are kind of standing around next to this tree um, waiting for this guy named Gatto to show up. And just kind of their antics as they wait for him. That's literally the story. <clears throat> and this idea of waiting for Gatto is, I think, such a compelling metaphor for the way being human feels, how we all, how I think we all kind of um, go through life thinking that something is about to happen, something great is about to happen, there's about to be some great arrival, and um, that that's going to like give our lives meaning and uh, tell us where to go and stuff. And um, so yeah, I that it, it really affected my just that my outlook on life in that way, um, and how we are all just kind of uh, you know bumbling around here waiting for Gatto. <laughs> um, so yeah, that is my last book. And um, now I want to tag uh, Marsha Osborne, who has a wonderful channel that you should all subscribe to. Um, and, uh, yeah, so that is the lame is tag. Um, yeah, thanks for watching, guys. Bye.